So, uh, as we talked about a little bit, we're thinking a little bit about prayer. The next eight weeks, we're going to be starting our, our first practice, sorry, our, our third practice in our series. And the series is been about 18 months long, our series called Practicing the Way. So we've been exploring various ways in which we can become more like Jesus for the benefit of others. Um, and uh, the, the understanding is, the theory is, that as we as we're invited to become more like our rabbi, more like um, our, our, our rabbi Jesus, we establish a rule of life. What is a rule of life? A rule, different to the rule as in thou shalt not rule, a rule is kind of like a schedule or a framework upon which we can fix, upon which we can uh, grow. So the, the word rule is kind of connected to the word trellis. And I've put a trellis there of a plant that grows up there. And so we have a, a variety of different um, practices that we do. So we've done, well, you tell me, which ones have we done? <laughs> We've done Sabbath, so top left, it's quite small there. But we've done Sabbath, uh, so we, well, look at us, we've done Sabbath. <laughs> we are practicing Sabbath through the rest of our lives so that something of the Sabbath revelation of God will seep into our muscle memory of our lives, that we might change and become a Sabbath people and thereby become a little bit more like Jesus for the benefit of others. Yes, what else have we done? Fasting. So we've covered fasting, done fasting. We are learning to be a people who fast, who abstain from food every now and again, preferably one day a week, but it doesn't have to be that, in order that that practice, something of the life of Christ, because Jesus fasted, seeps into the muscle memory of our lives that we might become a little bit more like him. Therefore, they are practices, things that we practice together. We never, we never master it. We practice it. We practice it together in community. And there are plenty more to do. Scripture, simplicity, generosity, hospitality, community, and solitude. Practices that become the building block, the, the trellis upon which our lives grow. Yeah? Okay, good. Excellent. So that's my little intro. What am I talking about with practices? Can I ask you a personal question? That's not the question, by the way. Um, can I ask you a personal question, which is not the question? How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? How's your life of prayer? I remember years and years ago, um, I asked someone to be my mentor, someone who might sort of ask me questions and, and kind of mentor me. And, uh, and they started with that one question. And when they asked me that question, I was slightly like, uh, I'm not sure I want to be mentored anymore. <laughs> Because he could have asked me a whole load of questions. He could have asked me, how's your family life? How's your marriage life? How's your, um, pr um, how's your worship life? How's your work life? But no, he chose, how's your prayer life? And I didn't really know how to answer it because my prayer life was a bit thin. It wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't really know how, how because prayer was sort of like an obligation or a duty. And I, sort of did it, but didn't do it very well. And I always felt a little bit guilty about it. And so he sort of pushed it to the side. Because then he also said, well, Tom, the thing is that everything flows from our prayer lives. And I'm like, really? Are you sure? Can't it flow from other stuff as well? Yes, it does. But he was trying to say so much of our life in Christ flows out of our prayer lives. How's your prayer life? You know, the poet, the 16th century poet and vicar, George Herbert, wrote lots of beautiful poems. I love his poems. Um, and he, his best poems, I think, he, he wrote around prayer. And he described prayer in the most beautiful, whimsical, poetic ways. He described it as a banquet. A ban prayer is a banquet. Prayer is really difficult to define. It's hard to put words to it. Therefore, he uses metaphor, poetry, in which to sort of capture something of what prayer is. He, he described prayer as the age of angels, the breath of God returning man to new birth. <laughs> what does that mean? 
<laughs> it's amazing. He goes on, he describes prayer as softness, prayer as peace, prayer as joy, love, and bliss. And then as he's writing these words, he's, it seems he runs out of adjectives as he begins to try and mine something of the, 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 meta, the, the poetry of prayer. And I wonder what the adjective that you would use to describe your prayer life at the moment. Be honest, you don't need to tell anyone, but what adjective comes to mind? It may not be a positive adjective, and that's okay, but we may as well start where we are. Let's not talk about prayer as if it's something out here. Let's talk about it as if this is the reality of it. My prayer life is... How's your prayer life, Tom? Now, the thing is, prayer can be hard work. Prayer can be difficult, can't it? Prayer can be boring, can it? It can be a little bit boring, mundane. We can get distracted by all the things on our to-do lists. We can start prayer with well intention and suddenly our brains drift away to all the thousands of different things that we need to do in our life because we are so important. Or as a spiritual writer once said, we spend our time just worrying in God's general direction. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? That's true. I'm sort of worrying in God's general direction. That'll be my prayer life. You see, the fact is, I think we live in, um, in, in one of the most difficult times in all of history to pray. I really do believe that. I think prayer is a profoundly difficult activity, but it's increasingly difficult in our heightened, we talk about this a lot, 24 seven digital age where one of these things distracts us every single time when we sit down to pray and it pings and it tells us that I'm more interesting than prayer. Not to mention all the social media, the internet, digital streaming, wall-to-wall -wall entertainment, noise pollution. It's actually very difficult to get silent, not only silent externally, but as we've talked about before, really difficult to be silent internally. That's the biggest battle for us, what it certainly is for me. When I close the door, close my eyes, everything is quiet in the house, but inner Tom is making a whole lot of noise. What do I do with that? I suppose the point I'm trying to say is that if you struggle with prayer, you're not alone. You're not alone. And yet, and yet, prayer is the portal. It is the gateway to life with God. The, you know, the life that we crave, that deepest part of my being, which longs for communion, for communication with God, union with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that longing deep within us that um, it, it says in the Old Testament that the Father, that God has set eternity into our hearts. That is the longing, the eternal longing that each and every one of us has. That is a longing for prayer. That is a longing for connection and union with God. I've got a little video here, which they play at the beginning of the prayer course as a starter, as a taster for prayer. Can we pray, play that, Paul? Thanks. Have you ever wondered why so many people are praying? Well, Albert Einstein said that there's really only two ways to live, as if nothing's a miracle or as if everything's a miracle. Either life's a fluke and we're just a bunch of highly evolved animals on a big rock lost in space, or there's a creator behind creation, a, a God behind goodness. And if so, then connecting with him in prayer is pretty much the most mind-blowing thing you can do. Archaeologists keep digging stuff up that shows we've always prayed. People of many faiths pray daily. Even atheists admit to praying sometimes. Real prayer is a two-way conversation with the living God who loves and listens to the things we say. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it'll be done. We have a chance to ask for peace, healing, help or whatever we need. Life matters, you matter, your choices, thoughts, prayers and actions echo in eternity. But 
In case you hadn't noticed, God is pretty much invisible and not always easy to hear. There are distractions, disappointments, and questions that we all share. That's why 24-7 prayer does stuff to help thousands of people in hundreds of places connect with God in new ways. People are learning to pray by just praying. And today, millions are discovering that God's real. Life's a miracle. And the most powerful thing you can ever do is to pray. God's real. Life's a miracle. And the most powerful thing you can ever do is to pray. Wow. That's extraordinary. If that is true, that is extraordinary, isn't it? God's real. Life's a miracle. Amen. Yes, it is. And the most powerful thing that I can do is pray. Wow. Something of that I want us to grasp this morning. This prayer is, you know, the picture here that we have that sticks in my mind in, in, the, in the little animation there is a little chap lying on the father's lap with his legs up like this and his head back. And, and God is in his, and he's just chatting away, chatting away. Isn't that a, a lovely image? Is that possible? We get a little bit more of that in a moment. You know, thankfully, Jesus has plenty to say on prayer. And so we're going to look at uh, Luke's um, gospel um, Alison, you did the reading, a short reading, and it was the Lord's Prayer, wasn't it? So that's where we're going to start. But before we start, I just want to just to pick up on something that the gospel writer Luke, um, he, he establishes a kind of a theme around Jesus and prayer in the preceding chapters that build up to the Lord's Prayer. Because in chapter five, Luke writes, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. That's why we are practicing prayer over the next eight weeks, because we want to do what Jesus did. In order for us to become more like Jesus, we have to see what he did and we do what he does. Okay? So in Luke 6, the next chapter, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God, the night praying to God. And then the next chapter, sorry, it's chapter nine, a couple of chapters later, it says, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountainside to pray. Can you see the pattern here? Can you see the practice? Can you see the rule of life that Jesus has already established in his life? And so the next time in chapter 11, we get this. Lord, and this is the disciples, they say, they say, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Teach us to pray, Jesus. That's a good prayer to start with, isn't it? Lord, teach us to pray. It's an interesting request that the disciples ask here. You see, Jesus did all sorts of amazing things. We know them. We know he did, didn't, don't we? But the disciples do not ask Jesus to teach them how to heal the sick. They don't ask him to teach them how to cast out demons or how to perform miracles. They ask him to teach them how. Perhaps it's because living with Jesus all the time, watching what he does, watching his daily pattern and rhythm of prayer, they realize that the extraordinary outer life that Jesus expresses with people and with others was the byproduct of his even more extraordinary inner life with God. Do you see that? His outer life was an expression, a byproduct of his miraculous and extraordinary inner life with God. Can we have the same inner life with God as Jesus? I don't know. <laughs> Bible says we can. Through the Holy Spirit and by God's grace, we can. You see, Jesus was experiencing something that the disciples weren't. They weren't experiencing that depth and intimacy with the Father that Jesus was evidently experiencing. And so they asked Jesus, we can tell that you are drinking from a deep well. Teach us how to drink from the same well. Teach us how to quench our thirst, drink the same water that you drink. That's what they're asking here. And then Jesus gives them the Lord's Prayer. 
You see, uh, there's a lot to say about the Lord's Prayer, and I, even within an hour, I'm not going to be able to do that. No, don't worry, it's not going to be an hour. Um, I, I'm Can I have a hand held? Hello, hand held. Okay. So let's look at the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at the first, just the first two verses of the Lord's Prayer. Because uh, whilst, whilst we understand and we know that the Lord's Prayer is a, a pre-made, it's liturgy, it's a pre-made prayer, isn't it? Um, it's also a theology. It is a profound theology. It gives us uh, a way to access God. It shows us how we can access God. You see, um, lots of people think that prayer is asking God for things. And there is an aspect of that in prayer. We ask God for stuff. But we notice in, in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus doesn't ask anything from the Father until halfway through in this prayer, does he? See, the first half of the prayer is orientation. You know that word? The first half of the prayer is move your gaze towards him. That is the first half. Even before we start to sort of say or ask God anything, it's about reorientating. And so Jesus says, I'll show you how to pray. But first of all, I want you to orientate yourselves towards him because this is absolutely crucial. And so I'm going to give you just four theological truths. There's a little bit of theology this morning. Four theological truths that serve as Jesus' framework for all prayer, I think. It's like a, a, a scaffolding for prayer. And the first one, really simple, the first one is that we can call God our Father. When Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he says, when you pray, say Abba. Now, Abba, Abba in the Aramaic, Abba in the Hebrew is Daddy. Sorry, in, in, in translation, it's Daddy or Papa. It is the intimate word that we might use to our father or our dads. Daddy, Abba. Now, this is a revolutionary way to address God. You know, Jesus wasn't taking something that, pe that they'd already done, that, to it, that there was Jew in Jewish literature, there was examples of people calling God Abba. No, this was a radical expression, a, a radical way of connecting and speaking to God as father. And Jesus' go-to name for God is Daddy. Radical. And now I understand for some of us, for some people, that can be hard perhaps due to difficult relationship that we might have with our earthly fathers. But for Jesus... What he's saying here, what for Jesus, what comes to mind when you think about God will make or break your prayer life. The first thing that you think about when you think about God will make or break your prayer life. You see, some might see God as a tyrant, or if you've experienced a father who is distant and disengaged and disconnected from you as a child, then chances are you will project that onto God. And here, right at the outset, right at the beginning of his instruction on how to pray, Jesus defines God as father. He effectively says, when you approach God, you need to understand that God is your daddy. And for many of us, our journey into a deeper life of prayer, which will take a lifetime, we are not going to master this in the next eight weeks, it'll take a lifetime, but our journey into a deeper life of prayer must begin with the healing of our false images of who God is. Do you hear that? It has to start with our, our false view of who God is. Because if we have an image or view of God as distant, disengaged, m m my story, God, in my mind, authority figure, God is a, is a, a headmaster, a strict headmaster who is out to ca catch me out. Um, but over time, as that false image of God was transformed, I started to understand God as Father. Uh, and that's helped my prayer life. 
as I understand God is my daddy. He is Papa. And how might I come to Papa? When my um, oldest son, Eli, was around two, um, I was, we were living uh, on site in a school, and I was teaching English and drama um, in this school, day school in London. And uh, as I was teaching, I remember a, a few times as I was teaching um, kids, uh, A-level, whatever, English or whatever, um, sometimes uh, I would see Eli toddling through the window um, he was coming towards the classroom. I was on the ground floor, and my heart would lift. I was sort of teaching, you know, something or other, pretty boring. No, no, it was desperately exciting. Anyway, I, I was teaching this, and I would see him from the corner of my eye, and my heart would go, oh, he's coming, he's coming. <laughs> And then he would come all the way. Sarah was obviously with him at the time. He wasn't just roaming the school. Um, but he would come and he knew exactly where the classroom was. And he knew exactly where it was. And it was one of those, and if the door was open from the outside, he could come in. And it was one of those fire doors which had glass on the front, on the outside. Um, much like that one over there, which you can't see, which is open. But, you know, glass all the way down. And he would press his little, his little face against the glass and just go, Dad, yeah! during my very important English lesson on Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, the, and the boys that I was teaching is, Sir, um, you, 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 your son uh, is, is making noises. And I'm like, I know, isn't it cute? <laughs> it's, and, it, and then he would literally open his mouth and sort of, you know, and, and they say, Sir, your son is licking the glass. <laughs> And I go, I know, isn't it so lovely? Isn't it so cute? No, it's disgusting, sir. And then I'd let him in. Now, why do I tell that story? You see, the first thing Jesus has to teach us about prayer is that the God we come before us, we come before, has a Father's welcoming heart and good intentions towards us. You see, I receive Eli, in, 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 you know, when he came with a welcoming heart, I had good intentions towards him. I was welcoming him, inviting him in. It, whatever I was doing was not too important for a two-year-old to come and disturb me. And you know, for some of us here, I think I really think we need to hear that. I need to hear this right now as I speak, that we all need to know God's intentions towards us are good. He has good intentions. He has a welcoming intention, a father's exuberant, wonderful, welcoming intention towards us. Whatever sounds that we might be making, whatever inarticulate sounds we might be making on the other side of the glass, God delights in that. You know, the primary emotional word used for God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, do you know what that word is? It is compassionate. It's compassionate. The Hebrew in the Old Testament is rakum, and it refers to the, to, uh, to the feeling a father, or more specifically, a mother has towards her infant child. And that is God's baseline emotional disposition towards you and towards I. You know, for some of us, there is an internal wrestle going on. Really? Really? Are you sure? Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. I'm not lying to you here. Compassionate is the predominant m word. Therefore, God's baseline emotional disposition towards you is compassion. It's love. It is one of a father crouching down and going, yes, come to me. So, God is a father. Point number one, theological point number one. Second, theological point number two, God is as close as the air. What do I mean by that? Because we say in the Lord's Prayer, when you pray, our Father in heaven. Now, when we pray this, I don't know about you, but I kind of think in heaven, you're way over there, God. You are in the, in the heavens. Because when we think, because in English, when most people read heaven, they think of a place that you go to when you die, and therefore it is not here. But while there's truth in that, in the Greek, the word is uranos, and it is plural, and it means the heavens, plural. 
And more literally, and I only read this this week, which I think is fascinating, more literally, it just means the air. So imagine as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we can pray our Father in the air. How does that change how we understand God's proximity? Because if we think about the air, we think about the air in our lungs. The air is all around us. The air is against our skin. The air is as close as, we, it can, as anything can possibly be to us. Jesus is teaching his apprentices, and therefore he is teaching us here today, this morning, that when we come to our Father in prayer, he is not far away. He is not distant. He is not behind a glass door, but closer to us. And this is, Thomas Merton says this, but closer to us than we are to ourselves. Wow. God is closer to us than we are even to ourselves. Father in the air. Yes, God is transcendent and glorious and other to us, but he is also imminent and close as the air to us. So that's my theological point number two. Theological point number three. We can enjoy the Father's company in worship. We can enjoy him in worship. And that's the phrase, hallowed be your name. Another tricky word to translate, hallowed, it's an unusual word. We tend not to use it in modern day language. Hallowed, but it means to revere. It means to respect the holiness of God. And to say God is holy is to say that there is no other being in all the cosmos more radiant than God. So when we say hallowed be your name, we are saying, God, you are holy, you are other, you are glorious, you are beautiful, you are transcendent, you are imminent, you are other, you are majestic. You know, and that's a good place to start. If we're struggling with prayer, a good place to start is to start worshiping. And that is what Jesus is saying. Worship him. Start in worship and everything else will flow from there. You see, Jesus is giving us a glimpse into his loving worship of his father as he hallows his father's name. And, um, and as I was preparing this this week, I was sort of thinking, well, how, how different is Jesus' approach to God to my approach to God? How do we approach God? How is it different? And, and in all honesty, and I think many of us here might agree, I, I hope, if we're really honest, we will, that we often approach God wanting something from him. Yes? Yes? We often come to God to get things from God that we feel we need to be happy. Yeah? And it's probably why most of us pray when our prayer lives really are activated, when we want something from God, when our situation is difficult, when a relationship is under threat, when a career or our physical health or whatever it is, a circumstance is difficult, that's when we start praying to God. And that is, that is a good thing. Don't hear me hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that that's not a good thing. It is a good thing. But it's also a bit of an indication from our own hearts, if we're really honest, that we're still searching for happiness outside of God. Do you hear what I'm trying to say here? Meaning that for most of us, God himself has yet to become our actual happiness. Because that is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, God the Father is the source of your happiness, not what he can do for you, not all the things that you think you might need from God to make me happy. Jesus is saying he is the source of happiness. Be united with him. Be connected to him. Know him. And that, that is the means of a fulfilled life. That is the means of a life of prayer. You see, the goal of prayer is just to enter into the beauty of God. And when you do that, you can't help but desire the world around you to experience that same beauty. So that's my third point. We can enter into worship. We hallow him name. And finally, very short, this bit. Our prayers really do make a difference. They make a difference. 
Many of you here looking out, I know that you have testimony. You have story of when you have prayed, things have happened. They have made a difference. We are sitting in a building that is, that is a product of prayer. We're sitting next to people whose lives are, are littered with, 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 with examples of answered prayer. Ask them. And let's notice this, Jesus assumes that his kingdom has not yet come and that his will has not yet been done. When we pray that, he's assuming it's not yet happened. It has in part, but it hasn't fully come to fruition. He assumes that through prayer, and I read this this week, we partner with God to bend reality in the direction of our Father's good intentions. I'm going to read that again. Jesus assumes that through prayer and intercession, we partner with Jesus to bend reality in the direction of the Father's good intentions. That is what we do when we, when we intercede. We partner with God. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We hope and are sure of that which we can't see, but I'm in, in, in the power of the Holy Spirit and partnering with Jesus. I am bending that reality towards God's good intentions. That is prayer. It's as if we're dragging the future age of the kingdom of God into the here and now. That is what's happening when we pray. I don't know why I'm doing this. I sort of feel like I need to. I'm taking that, the promises of God, and applying it to my life and to the life of those I know and love and say, this is the Father's good intentions. I don't really understand the mechanism because it's a profound theological sort of mystery, but at the same time, that is important, and I'm going to declare it in the name of Jesus. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. So, God is our Father. God is not distant and far away. He is as close as the air. The main thing about prayer is not to get things from God, but to delight in God himself. And let's remember that our prayers actually make a difference. Now, that's all, all the theory. What about the practice? You know, I love when we talk about practicing the way because it, it, it gives me the opportunity to say your homework for this week. <laughs> I'm very shallow, sorry. Uh, our homework for this week. You see, we've been talking, we've been thinking about talking to God and God has given us through scripture hundreds, thousands of already written prayers uh, in the Psalms in the Lord's Prayer, in our songs that we sing. St. Augustine said famously, to sing is to pray twice. Wow. To sing is to pray twice. I love that. You know, we don't think that our modern songs are particularly liturgical, the choruses that we sing. We don't think that they're a liturgy, but of course they are. They are pre-written prayers. And then we've got formal liturgies. In the Anglican Church, we have lots of formal prayers and formal liturgies. We've even got apps on our phone to help us pray. I've been using a, a Catholic app called Hallo. It is beautiful. It is lovely. Don't worry, I'm not becoming a Catholic, but it is really lovely. And these set prayers can anchor us. They can hold us. They can help us, particularly if we don't have any words, particularly if we're really tired and we've got a newborn, particularly if we are in a dark night of the soul and we're desperate and we don't really know what to pray. I've spent a week just praying the first three lines of Psalm 23. And so our homework for this week, and I can see that Alfred's got his phone out because he's going to be writing the homework for this week. Well done, Alfred. Gold star. See me afterwards. Well done. Um, and our homework for this week, I'd love to encourage us all to take a psalm, one psalm for this week. Let's see if we can do this together. We're going to practice it together. I'm not going to tell you which psalm. In fact, I think I've written some psalms down as a suggestion, Paul. Are they on? There they are. Wow. Here's some, here's some suggestions. But take one, either of these, or any psalm that you know and you love. And I'd love you to pray it 
every day this week. And what do I mean by pray it? So let's say I would take Psalm 91, one of my favorite Psalms, and it starts, they who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And so what I'll do is I'll read that. That's in the NIV. I'll read it. And then I'll stop. And then I'll go, Lord, I don't know how to dwell. <laughs> I'm struggling to know how to rest. Help me to rest in your shadow. So I'll take the words that David has written and turn them into prayer. And then continue. And it may be that your, your prayer after about four verses or even one verse, you get there's masses to say. But that's praying the psalm. And I'd love us to start talking to God this week as a practice. Just a couple of pointers before we move on. And I hand over to Rebecca in a moment. So why doesn't Ben and the band come? Why don't you come up? I read this week, I've been listening to a podcast called Returning to the Mystics. And, uh, and one of the mystics is Thomas Merton. And, and he said this, and it absolutely, boom, just this week. It said, with God, a little sincerity goes a long, 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 long way. With God, a little sincerity goes a long, 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 long way. What does he mean by that? Being sincere in our prayers, being honest in our prayers, just saying how we're doing, being sincere, sincere devotion in prayer. So that's a, an, an, added, an added extra homework for those of you looking to do the extra homework. The extra homework is sincerity. Be honest. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Let's end with that picture of the little boy lying in the, in the cartoon with his legs crossed and his hands behind, yapping away to the father. Sincerity is a good place to start. How's your prayer life? Let's be sincere. God, I, I'm not a very good prayer. I don't feel I pray very well, but I'm going to pray this psalm this week, and I'm going to practice doing that, and it's habit Remember, we've talked about this a lot. It, is, it only comes by regular doing. Find a time this uh, in the mornings, preferably, I think, and say, okay, Tom's told me to do this homework. I'll get a bad mark if I don't do it. No, 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 you won't. Um, I'm going to do this homework. I'm going to practice the presence of God. I'm going to practice prayer this week. Why don't we stand together?